All right. We're ready. We're here. It's happening. It is on. <laughs> hey, Pamela. How's it going? It's going good. Oh, man, the weather is really nice now. It, is- it's beautiful, but oh, my God, the pollen. Oh, really? Yeah. No, this is when it starts to paradise here on Vancouver Island. So I do all my traveling from like October to April, and then I just stay here from May through September. Not going anywhere now. Yeah, it's stunningly beautiful, and my eyes are red to match the tulips. <laughs> That's good. Um, I don't, if people have been catching this, you've been taking some great pictures on Google+, Plus, some really nice photos on in your stream. It's good. Thank you. It's, yeah, I... I can enjoy the flowers in small bursts and they're better better consumed digitally. Right? You, just, you just like tough it out, get a picture, yeah. you're, then you're driven, <laughs> eye streaming from the flowers. Oh, I was riding my horse the other day and my trainer gave me this odd look and I realized tears are just streaming down my face due to the pollen, not, to do, not due to fear of death, but she wasn't convinced it was the pollen and not fear of death. <laughs> yeah. So if for anyone who's never done this before, we're going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast. This is going to be the third part of our trilogy uh, on space stations and we're going to talk about the International Space Station and ideally the Tiangong. I don't know if that's in your head. And the... Um, and some of the private space stations, Bigelow, et cetera. Um, so that'll take us about half an hour or so, and then once that's wrapped up, we will stick around and take any questions that you might have, either about the topic that we discussed or just any topics in space and astronomy. By all means, feel free to break Pamela's brain. If, Please don't break it. I what, need it whatever is left after I'm done asking all these questions, you're, you're free to just fry the rest. Um, <laughs> Yes, 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 absolutely free. Um, uh, right, so, um, yeah, and so if you want to give us some questions, now I kind of messed up today's uh, show a bit. I, I posted the event twice accidentally. Well, I posted it once, and then I, I didn't make it public, and then you can't turn a private event to a public event, which is, you know, a, I think a mistake for Google+. Plus. Um, so I had to do a second event, and so there's two events, and so you might be watching this video in two locations which makes the chances of you posting on those event pages and actually reaching us not great. So uh, I highly recommend that if you are watching this and you want to post your questions, click on the video and watch it on YouTube. And that's the place where it's the safest spot that, that we should be getting your, your questions. Um, but you can post on the event page, and I know you will, and you can post on the on YouTube, and I see a bunch of questions already, so I'm, that's probably safe. You can also post questions in, uh, if you're watching this on Google+, Plus, just in the stream, or um, if you're watching this somewhere else embedded and you just like to use Twitter, just use the hashtag AstronomyCast, and we should catch all those comments. So by all means, as we're doing the show, post your ideas, your suggestions, any, you know, anything, and I'll, I'll try and sort of work them into the show if it's... Uh, if it's sort of appropriate, so cool. All right, so I'm I'm ready to go. You ready to go? Yeah. Ready for me to press record? Mm-hmm. Okay, I am pressing record, and it's recording. Okay, great. All right, let me just get my intro up in front of us. Uh, this might take a while. <laughs> you might have to stop. I don't know why they. Our wiki is not going. Our Google site. That's weird. Okay, let's. Okay, stopping my recording. Yeah, stop your recording. Oh, great. Couldn't. It. Gimp. Google. So we store everything that we're doing on a Google site that's set up as a wiki so that that we can basically get all the information to all the people we need. But Until when, we can't. Is yours working? Can you access the Google site? Let me see. Okay, I'm going to have to grab my laptop then. Just give me one second. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes the Googles fail. Wow, sites.google.com went away. All my life is there. Google, please give it back. I need it back. Not that Google is listening to me. There are a few of you sitting there watching me monologue at my computer in slight panic 
because I realize none of my okay. staff can access. Sites.google.com is down. Nice. 502. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm getting to. So no problem. I had it up on my laptop, and so I will just uh, read it from my laptop, and then uh, we'll go from there. So My life is on that. <laughs> well, I hope it wasn't important. Um, okay, uh, all right. So could we start this again? Yes. Oh, critical error has occurred, it now says. Nice. Okay. Oh, oh joy. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to click record. You ready? Uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Starting from time zero. Yeah. Say one. It's going. All right. Astronomy Cast, episode 298 for Monday, March 18th, 2013. Space Stations, part three, the International Space Station. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? <laughs> How are you doing? Good, good. A few technical <laughs> snafus as we're attempting to start this show up, but uh, we'll get through it. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, we of course record these episodes every Monday at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern as a Google Plus Hangout. So you can watch us live if just getting the episode on your uh, podcatching software isn't enough and you want to actually see what goes into making this show and you get to see all of the shenanigans that go on around it all of the mistakes that we make, all the times that we go back and have to re-record something. Good times. And and for those of you who aren't able to watch live, we're working to hopefully within a few hours of each recording get these recordings up onto Astrosphere vids. So you can actually get the raw show much earlier than you can get the, the fully processed by yeah. Preston, whom we love, but he can't do things instantaneously. Yeah. And we're aware a bunch of people are like wondering like why are there stuff on YouTube before there's stuff in the in the, the stream on like iTunes and stuff like that. And it's just because there's there's all these steps, all these, you know, each piece. We record the show and then it goes to get goes to press and to get edited and then it comes out. We're trying to narrow, narrow that gap. So that's why there's sort of delays. So uh, cool. Was there any announcements that you had this week? I can't think of any other than if you're a US citizen, please write your Congress critters and tell them that we do want to see science education in America funded by the same places where the science is happening. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the uh, proposed White House budget removes science education from NASA, the NIH, uh, all of the places where you have science educators partnered with scientists and it focuses all of the science education at the Department of Education, um, researches at the National Science Foundation, and outreaches at the Smithsonian. Uh, this has the potential to actually cut all of my funding and end a lot of the really awesome programs you may rely on, like the Night Sky Networks, the Solar System Ambassadors, Astronomy Picture of the Day. All of us are in jeopardy right now. Astronomy Picture of the Day? No. I love that that's the one that you're upset about. <laughs> oh, I love those guys. Bob Nimroff. And, yeah, and that's such a great resource. That's crazy. That would be crazy to, to, to do that. All and right. this is why people need to write their Congress critters. Yeah, exactly. There's so much great education outreach that's happening. It would be insane to cut it off. All right, well, let's get rolling. So now we reach the third part in our trilogy on space stations with the largest vehicle ever assembled in space, the International Space Station. Launched in 1998, it now consists of 450 metric tons of modules, power systems, and spacecraft, and is regular host to a handful of astronauts from many countries. All right, Pamela, so today we're going to talk about the International Space Station and also some other space stations that are in orbit as we speak, including the, Ch the Chinese Tiangong and the... Uh, Bigelow, is that still happening? I think it's still Yeah, Bigelow, they have their inflatables up there. Yeah, their inflatable spaceship. Um, so, uh, man, and so now we're entering the modern era because, I mean, all of the space stations that we've talked about so far have all been deorbited, and uh, and now we finally have a space space station that is actually fully fully in orbit right now. It's a fully operational a fully, space station. Fully, oh, you went there. Um, <laughs> so, but I mean, I mean, there have been a ton of sort of ideas on the on the books and different sort of back and forth that went into the space station, starting with like the space station was it Freedom and you know different ideas. So, can you go back and sort of give the history of of the space station? 
So the, the current space station is actually an amalgamation of several different nations pretty much not having enough money to do what they wanted, so that they banded together in a um, forcing the puzzle pieces to fit kind of manner. So on the U.S. side, we had uh, plans to build the space station Freedom, where some of the original plans in the mid-80s actually had it as three separate orbiting platforms where you had a cargo bay where people could uh, build um, on-orbit construction of stuff. It was basically a giant hangar orbiting planet. There was the science modules. Uh, these three different orbiting platforms. And then we didn't really have the billions and billions to do that, so it got curtailed and curtailed until eventually it was a single vehicle, uh, multiple modules, including a Japanese science module. Uh, it had solar arrays, and when the Congress looked at the new budget, they still said no, so they move, removed an entire truss of solar <laughs> arrays um, and, and gradually worked on trying to bring costs down, starting construction. On the Russian side, uh, we had, and it was Russia at this point, we had, uh, they were working on space station Mir 2. And uh, again, this was going to be new replacement space station, bigger, better than everything before. They started construction on the pieces. In Europe, uh, they were also working on their own platform. They had the Columbus uh, Science Platform, which actually ended up eventually being part of the International Space Station. Uh, Canada was tied in as the builder of arms. It builds robotic that, arms. That's that what is what we do. Does. It's what we build you do. robot arms. But but all these different nations didn't really have the ability to do everything on their own. So initially what happened was you had the European Space Agency. They tagged along with the Russians. They were going to be part of Mir 2. Then as Russia and America started to realize, well, maybe we can work together. This is where the uh, Mir shuttle program began. Uh, it became more and more realistic to just scrap the idea of each nation doing their own separate space station. And it was decided that we'd actually take the pieces that were already in construct under construction for Mir 2, take the pieces that were already under construction for Freedom, keep the Japanese module, keep the European Space Agency modules, and just launch and put all the pieces together. Uh, this required some rejiggering of the architecture, you might imagine. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was not a graceful process. This, this is the armadillo of spaceships. Not armadillo, this is the platypus of spaceships. Right, right. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, you've got this situation where you've got all of these different countries and, and you know, with different histories of flight hardware, especially yeah. like the Russians, and they had their way that they put their spaceships together in the way they docked them and their, and their you know, the different modules. And, and to then, after the fact, after these, these spacecraft had already been built to kind of, or in the plans to be built and parts of them had built and, and they'd say, okay, let's try and attach these all together in some kind of useful configuration. But I mean, fortunately, yeah. the Americans had lots of practice with Mir, with the Atlantis, all of the docking that they did with that. They well, knew, and and you know, the thing is, talk. the the starts of of building the International Space Station actually came out of starting to go to Mir. It was decided pretty much the exact same time that we were going to be flying to Mir and we were going to be building ISS as a joint partnership with Russia. So we wouldn't have had one if we didn't have the other. This was sort of an all or nothing gamble that we played with the Soviets or Russians as the case turned out to be. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so we've got sort of all of these, these countries agreeing to come together and build this international space station, this international mm -hmm. effort. Uh, so, so when did things actually start to get rolling? What was sort of the first? Well, the, the first components went up in 1998. The Mir space station was still in use, still being occupied. It would be two more years before they had enough components of the International Space Station on orbit that they could really occupy it full time. And they also had to overcome a lot of um, well, what spacecraft were using types of questions. The original plans for Mir 2 had the Soviets 
later Russians, using the Buran space plane. The European Space Agency also had plans for their own space plane that didn't happen either, the Hermes. And so then, okay, we've scrapped two different space planes. Now how are we getting things up there? Okay, so we still have the Soyuz. We still have the Progress. At that point, we still had the space shuttle. All of these have different docking mechanisms. Okay, so we have to build these different docking mechanisms. Then we have to figure out, well, what about spacesuits? This, this starts to get where it looks almost silly because American spacesuits and Russian spacesuits aren't the same for obvious reasons. They were built by two different manufacturers, just like Levi's jeans and Gap jeans aren't identical jeans. Um, but with a spacesuit, they're kind of bigger than a pair of jeans, and it turns out that the Russians can go through smaller doors than the Americans can, and this has nothing to do with the average weight of our two populations. It's just the, the U.S. spacesuits are that much bulkier. So we had to have different doors to ac accommodate different sized spacesuits. Right. Just problem after problem after problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, right, and so then, so the first module went up uh, back in to in sorry in ninety eight, and which one was that? That was the uh, was that it, I believe with the Zvezda, Zarya. Zarya, you're right. Was Zarya? Yeah, yeah was Zarya. Right. Sea. Yeah. 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 And then followed up with Zvezda, and then you know, you know, year after year, mission after mission, they just kept launching more and more of these modules. And and the thing is, it's actually not done yet. That that's one of the things that we often forget somehow is is there's still more things waiting to come and more modules that will be replaced. Um, this this is uh, an an ongoing never ending spacecraft project. Do you know how long they're planning to continue launching modules to the space station? Well, it, currently they have plans going up through 2015, but it's believed that the space, sta the space station can probably exist at least through 2020 and probably through 2028. Wow. Okay, yeah. right. So it's going to be there for, for a while. And, and, I mean, the space station cancellation, I mean, you know, the space station did most, sorry, the space shuttle launched most of the modules up there to, to date. You know, with that great cargo bay, and it could dock, and they could pull out the the module and attach it to the space station. But now, without the space shuttle, it's going to have to go to some of these other, you know, more traditional rockets that are going to be launching modules up there. And and it was only really the American uh, pieces that were were launched by the shuttle. This really is a um, multinational but not equally shared space station. So. Well, we did take up a bunch of the trusses. We did take up all of the U.S. components for the most part. There, there was one component that was launched by the Russians for us. We launched one thing for them. Um, they don't even let Americans use the Russians' toilet, in theory. I've, I've heard that it, that really? isn't enforced. But yeah, it's, huh. it's, there's a Russian crew component department, an American crew compartment, um, and, and so there really are lines of demarcation. And it, that's funny that you talked about the toilets, because that's often, you know, the main question that I know the astronauts often get is like, how do you go to the bathroom on the space station? It sucks, quite literally. <laughs> how, how do they do this? <laughs> they, they have basically a, a toilet-shaped orifice built onto the a machine that has fans that suck the air and whatever is coming out of you. Yeah. And there is also a anatomically correct hose that has male and female attachments um, right. to collect liquid waste. Have you ever had a chance to sit on one of these? This no. is an example of it? No. 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 They sometimes, I know they've had, I'm trying to remember where I saw an example of it. Uh, I think I was... When we were in um, California, I was at the California Science Center, and they had a, an example of the toilet where they had the Endeavor spacecraft parked. You could get a chance to see what they used on the space on the space shuttle. Uh, right. Okay. So let's talk about the crew then. So we've talked about how the modules came together, and and I mean, there's just like too many modules to talk about, and all of the power systems, and I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's an amazing, enormous vehicle. Uh, but let's talk about the crews because, you know, again, it's an international space station, so it's going to be an international crew. 
Right, and, and currently, actually, the, the commander of the ISS is a Canadian, Chris Hard Hadfield. Chris Hadfield, yeah. And uh, so it's, it's one of these things where they cycle through the nations, picking who's best for what they're currently doing to be in charge of the mission. There's been uh, Russian commanders, American commanders, now there's a Canadian commander. The crews are, are allocated based on who has bought into the mission. So the, the Italians kind of cheated. They are both part of the European Space Agency, but they also did some um, off the ESA books uh, construction for the Americans. So uh, the Italians get some of the Americans uh, share as well of the time. Uh, Canada bought in with the Americans through their arm. Uh, European a Space Agency is bought in through the Russians, and and so there's careful allocation of who gets time to do what. Japan is in there with their individual module that was uh, sent up as part of the American collaboration, um, and so all these different nations have the the right to send astronauts into space, and uh, all of the different astronauts take care of the experiments from all of the different nations once they make it on orbit. So um, let's talk about the money, because it has been a, a very billions expensive, and billions. billions and billions. Do you know what the sort of full price tag for for like construction and launching and maintenance and screwing this this... It, it, I found the number been. earlier. I'm I'm scrolling back to to refind it again. Um, Hundreds of billions. It's it's for for both nations. Um, yeah. The NASA budget for the space station has been about seventy two billion in two in two thousand and ten dollars. Um, it was one hundred and fifty billion when you include the space shuttle flights. Yeah. Um, it's it's estimated that it's seven point five million ish per person day. Um, that's wow. kind of huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a it's been a very very expensive thing. And I think you know one of the situations that that you're dealing with personally is just that you know this spacecraft is up there. It's manned by human beings yeah. who are, you know, are there nonstop. I mean, NASA and the and the other countries have to continue funding this thing to to keep it going. And any, yeah. you know, and any excess money that it requires, it gets funded and other stuff has to suffer because of it. Yeah. You know, science and, and other space exploration. And and this is done through international treaties such that, well, America has several times uh, curtailed our budget, uh, much to the dismay of our international colleagues who were basically told, sorry, we know you built that, we're not going to launch it now, we don't have the money. And and America can only do that so many times. Uh, it It's one of these things where when there's international agreements in place, if you keep breaking your contracts over and over, no one's going to work with you anymore. So we have to be careful how often we break treaties. Um, so there's this this horrible dichotomy of there's, there's contracts and treaties in place saying we will keep doing the following things, coupled with an economic downturn and cuts to NASA's budget. So we have an ever-increasing expense with the ISS. We have contractual obligations to keep it. And where does the money come from? Well, it comes from people like me getting our budgets zeroed. Right. So. Well, let's talk about what, what they use it for. So, I mean, science, right? They, they are doing a variety of different experiments that range from things like launching sunflower seeds and then distributing them to researchers to watch them grow for nine months. Uh, launching fish, seeing how they swim, growing plants on orbit. A lot of the experiments they do are geared at trying to figure out, can we survive long-term in space? Can we grow uh, the fish and plants that we need if we want to uh, continue out and colonize out to Mars? Uh, in addition to that, they do a variety of different uh, microgravity experiments. Uh, they have over 50 different science racks that are a variety of ever-changing experiments that get launched, orbit for a period of time. It has a high bandwidth antenna to get information back and forth. 
and a lot of those experiments are proprietary so I can't actually tell you what they are that's one of the interesting things is this is getting used for a variety of different uh, experiments that, that are funded both privately and through government funds and they're quite small and they will all hopefully eventually see publication but you can't just look up somewhere what every single experiment going on on the ISS is. Uh, some of the more um, noticeable experiments are things like uh, monitoring how bodies change in terms of when you're on orbit your face puffs out so when we see the images of the astronauts you can actually see the results and then I think the most shared results of experiments are um, it, and it's not so much an experiment as, as having fun and learning along the way is they take tons of photos of the earth that get used for meteorology, get used for earth science and also get used to just communicate the overview effect of what it's like to see the earth from space. And so I mean I think you know we've talked about this before you know my real position here is that you know human beings real goal eventually is going to be to travel in space to learn how to exist in space and the only way to do that is to spend a lot of time in space yeah. and kind of see what goes wrong and then take each one of those things that goes wrong and fix it so that so that next time it's not going to be a problem and that's going to be everything from how do you go to the bathroom to how do you make sure that you have enough water to drink and can you grow food and just keep extending our presence out in space and so right. this is this next iteration of this process because these these astronauts go up and they're up there for for months and months on end yeah and and at this point now with so many missions that have happened the you know we really started to learn what the impact is on their bodies what what ways they can mitigate the the effect on it and then how to help them recover when they, they get back and eventually hopefully we'll be able to live there you know in space forever and be a true spacefaring yeah civilization. Be, being an astronaut isn't an easy life. Uh, everyone romanticizes it, but these guys are up at 6 a.m. They have to exercise two or more hours every day to just prevent uh, massive amounts of muscle loss. They're undergoing bone degeneration. They're being subjected to levels of radiation that aren't allowed on the surface of the planet. There's actually special OSHA regulations that allow astronauts to experience Experience higher levels of radiation than would otherwise be allowed. Um, they work 10-hour days uh, Monday through Friday, five hours on Saturday. They do get Sunday off. Uh, they are expected to do everything from spacewalks to construct and repair things. Uh, there was a solar panel that they noticed today has what looks like a bullet hole going through it from either a micrometeorite or a piece of space junk uh, to running basic um, pull this rack out, put this one in for the experiments to uh, they communicate with ham radios to schools all over the world. They have to be engineers, scientists, communicators, educators all at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about how the various space stations have ended their lives, uh, you know, with the, uh, you know, with Mir, they, they were able to deorbit it. Skylab, they weren't so successful and ended up crashing in the Australian now back. Uh, so, I mean, if the, you know, if the space station lasts into the 2020s, I mean, what are the plans to eventually, you know, for its end of life? Well, there's, there's been various discussions of taking some of its, uh, some of its modules, repurposing those for uh, yet another generation space station. Um, but they will have to deorbit the bulk of it somehow. And, and that's going to be just like it was with Mir, a matter of steer, drop, dive, crash into the ocean with any pieces that survive. But what I really appreciate is the way it's been built, they have pulled modules off, replaced modules, and they're looking towards the future, uh, continuing to do things like that where there are plans to replace modules in the future. There are plans, for instance, to test the viability of using Bigelow inflatable modules attached to it. Uh, there's plans to launch one, attach it, seal it off other than to go in and do tests, which I find highly amusing. We're going to put it there. It's going to be fully habitable. We don't trust it, so we're not going inside unless we have to. It's, it's pretty much the way it, it's spec'd out. 
but they they are going to continue to refurbish what they can and they will now that things are on orbit they will continue to uh, keep what they can before they bring down through the atmosphere what they can't are there any plan you know are they talking about any successor to the International Space Station now or is this just the only conversation that they have is there anything I, in the works so so honestly the discussions that come up and down periodically aren't ones that I would trust right now for the very simple reason that I think we're at a turning point where we could decide to go and build a more permanent facility on the moon we could choose to uh, make a break for the asteroids or Mars and depending on what choices we make we need a very different orbiting platform from which to launch ourselves uh, it's also becoming more and more clear that before we do too much more we need to start cleaning up what we've done to outer space there's a lot of space junk and uh, keeping a large object like the ISS in low earth orbit it's subject to collision <laughs> sorry yeah yeah, right, and they, they're constantly having to move it. You know, you yes. know, you, I, you get these alerts that they're going to have to do a firing of its rockets to move it because of some possible impact with some piece of space debris. So this is getting worse and worse over time. And, and during one of the more recent spacewalks, we also had a, a case of uh, one of the astronauts dropped one of the experiments and it flew away. And while it appears to be in an orbit that won't ever intersect the International Space Station again, that doesn't mean that some future space station won't be in its way. Yeah. And, and so just the fact that dropping a wrench can create a hazard that could endanger the lives of all the astronauts that that's a pretty stark reality to live in yeah well I'd like to shift gears a bit then one talk about the Bigelow space station because that's the other space station that's or Bigelow space stations How many? but that's another this is a private space station which right. inflatable so do you have you uh, any information on that so so, so Bigelow has now launched two different modules at different scales. Uh, they go into space. Uh, they have critters on them as long as the critters live. We talked about this in, in detail during one of our um, Animals earlier. in space. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the idea of these is to find a way to launch a large capacity uh, volume you could live in but to launch it at low cost with low shipping weight and and to make space as affordable and easy to to survive in as possible and they're taking the idea of a giant inflatable and probably taking it as far to its limit as you can go these are inflatable spacecraft uh, one of the things that when they they test a module out attached to the ISS they're going to look at is what is the leak rate because they know these things do leak just like all balloons leak uh, what is their durability and the the idea is eventually you can launch a space hotel a commercial space platform that is just blow up ball after blow up ball with uh, solar panels attached to them as I said they, they've tested two of these so far um, they've gotten to the point of, of launching bugs that's okay Yes, yeah. fly to. Um, but their next big test is going to be in 2015, where they have one that is suitable for humans to occupy it that will be attached to one of the ports on the ISS. And while the plan isn't to live in it, the astronauts will access it to take data periodically. But you can see this kind of coming together. You've got all of the the private you know, accomplishments of SpaceX, where you've got a fairly inexpensive, relatively inexpensive flight system. You've got a private space hotel that uh, could be available to, to astronauts and to tourists in the future, that the whole, this whole concept of space tourism is starting together. And I think, you know, 10 years ago, you might have thought, no one's going to pay millions of dollars to go up into space. But now there's been a handful of of actual private tourists who've been to the International Space Station. They paid, you know, thirty million, thirty and million, each. Do, yeah, each. You know, and I'll bet you there is a lineup of super rich people who would love nothing more than to spend a bunch of nights in space in a, you know, in the cramped conditions of a space hotel. I mean, you know, hotel is a terrible way to describe it. You know, well, but but if you've ever stayed space camping. In <laughs> 
right? <laughs> you know, you fly up into this like little inflatable tent and then you just try to not die and you look out the window for two days and you well, come back you, home. <laughs> in, in some big cities and at some major airports, they have those pod hotels where you basically get this slide door cubby that's the size of not even a twin bed and and that's pretty much what we're looking at in space for the astronauts and yeah. it, as it stands the Americans have that on on their crew compartments uh, they have no windows but they have soundproofed bunks the the Russians have windows and no sound well limited soundproofing on their bunks um, so it's it's looking towards a future where commercial tourists pay for slightly improved characteristic uh, slightly improved quarters to what we give our astronauts. But I think this whole concept of these, these inflatable space station modules is pretty exciting and, and there's been a lot of development work and I know NASA is taking it very seriously because you can launch something that's fairly small and then you can inflate it and you know and it can provide what you require in space. It provides the pressure. It's like a spacesuit that you hang out inside. And, and Bickle is building all of these with uh, an eye towards being able to partner with SpaceX using their Dragon capsules, uh, using uh, their standard rockets, the Falcon series. Uh, so as as we look towards the future, it's it's not NASA, NASA, NASA. It's NASA contracting private companies to build the. Uh, space components and to build the spacecraft and right. so this is a completely new model that's starting to parallel more like what the military does when it buys airplanes from Boeing or Lockheed and so the and you know the big country that we talked about that that was absent from the International Space Station is the Chinese and so yeah. they were left out of the or chose to not be a part no, of... They, they were banished by the US Congress there for a variety of reasons that I have to admit I don't understand. Um, America's Congress has uh, written a number of policies that make it almost impossible to partner with the Chinese. Uh, we can't use NASA funding to go visit China. The Chinese are absolutely not allowed on the International Space Station. And, and because of this, China basically they took their toys and went away and you can't blame them for that and so they're working on building their own uh, space platform that's, that's um, built on the history of the Salyut series space stations but takes them in new directions uh, as they they work towards having a multi-module uh, space station that will have multiple uh, servicing missions, multiple crews able to come and go. So far they, they've followed the Salyut plan in terms of they've launched uh, space stations that had a single crew. Right. They've done that twice now, but their next one they're looking to have will be that multiple crews coming and going, bringing supplies type of space station. So they're, but they're, but they're, their space station, that was the Tiangong, it's, it's still, I'm trying to think, is it still orbiting? I believe it's still orbiting, but it's yeah. not still being used. It's not inhabited right now. Yeah, it had only 20 days of life support, and it was launched. Um, actually, so it went up this year. Yeah, when did they launch Tiangong? Sorry, everyone pressed 29 September 2011. So they launched it. But Tiangong almost, 2. Yeah, almost two is years after Tiangong 1. At. Uh, and then Tiangong okay, Tiangong two. two hasn't launched yet. That was right. confusion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, but this is, I mean, this is right. And then there's going to be the Tiangong three coming yeah. as well, right? And so the, you know, they're going to be creating their own modular space station bit by bit over time, very similar to like Mir or the, you know, a smaller version of the International Space Station. So, so to to start that over and get it correct this time. Um, so Tiangong One, uh, it, it went up. It had a single crew. They're planning a second one that will again be a single crew. Um, but it's with Tiangong Three that they're going to move into that multiple crew, multiple module space future, following very much the plans of what was done with Salyut and Mir. Yeah, I you know definitely wouldn't count them out. I mean, I think they're doing this yeah. on a much more I don't know, shoestring budget uh, on a, you know, it's, it's absolutely copied Russian hardware, but then, you know, with modern improvements and the, they're following in, you know, almost the, the Russian methodology 
very carefully and very closely. So big cost savings there. So I think they're you know they're going to make pretty significant advances. The question is, you know, where are they going to go? Next, I mean, are they going to be the ones to return to the moon? Who knows? So it's 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 unclear. And the the thing is that they have a nation that can throw an entire industry at innovating space technologies. And while they don't think that they can get the launch process down to be as cheap as what SpaceX is doing, they are producing a much more educated society, and they have a much larger consumer base and much larger tax base. And that all adds up to a very bright future for their space agency. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on that and give you an update a few years down the down the road from now. All right, well, that was a bit of a longer show, but thank you very much, Pamela. <laughs> thank you. No, don't go away. We're just saving. Save. Export. I hate allergies. No. Oh. And upload. Okay, we're safe. Okay. But for how long? All right, cool. Well, I'm going to take some questions that people have asked. Now, remember. Remember, uh, you don't have to just ask us questions about the International Space Station, although we've got a bunch of them there, uh, but we can also take questions about any, any, any aspect of space and astronomy. The, the harder, more complicated, the better. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, let's go with some... Uh... Okay, so Brandon Hess asks, how well are we tracking all of this space junk that's in orbit? Uh, there's several thousand pieces of debris that have known orbits that are being tracked by NORAD. Um, I don't know what percentage of the debris that counts as, but it's a fairly high amount. It's, it's actually quite complicated to track, but we're doing our best. Um, so Cheshire Tomcat 68 says, we need to invent a space vacuum cleaner to clear out the junk out of orbit before launching a space tent. But I, but I think that you know, that that when you're inside a metal spaceship or an aluminum spaceship, you're not any better protected than if you're inside a, a space tent. Um, you're a little bit better protected. A, a it, little bit better. I've, so I've, I've got it, an image here that I want to show you. A seven gram object. Yeah, I know exactly which image you're going to yeah, pull up. Yeah, yeah. This is just, this is just terrifying. Yeah. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Yeah, right here. Let me just show you this. So that's a seven gram object that has uh, crashed into what was it? Um, a uh, piece of fifteen aluminum. centimeter. Yeah, block. Yeah. So this is a solid block of aluminum. So essentially, <clears throat> seven grams in order bit striking the International Space Station will go through this much solid aluminum. So, you know, it's it's sort of it's kind of similar to like when they stopped using armor in the you know in war when you realize that a bullet was just going to go right through your metal armor and then it was just slowing you down anyway. So, yeah. So I don't I don't think that now I guess the question though is like you know if you do get an impact is the whole thing going to deflate and, and you're going to lose all of your pressure? But but these it, things it's are. Also it's also a matter of structural integrity because yeah. if you have something that's an inflatable, it has the ability to, to torque and rotate much more readily than a solid object. And you can imagine the situation of you end up with vibrations in your solar panels or any of the other vibrational problems that you end up with on space stations could have a much greater effect on an inflatable than it would on a solid body. And we don't know if that's going to be the case. These are just suppositions at the moment, and this is why they're going to have to test it by attaching it to the ISS. Um, so Zenite Org, I think I know who this is, um, notes that uh, practically speaking, the U.S. needs to take on projects that can be accomplished in eight years or less, preventing presidential course changing. And I think that's a really good point, right? That that when you get these 
these projects that are going to take multiple presidential uh, terms, then each, you know, as the power changes, as the as the party changes, they're going to go and sort of undo and course correct everything that's been set up by the previous party. You know, have you seen that happen with, you know, the amount of time you've been spending yeah. connected to this? Well, it it's not just the president. It's also the House of Representatives. It's the Congress. And so really anything that takes longer than two years is is subject to change. And even two years is sometimes too long to think. Um, it's right now a very bleak situation, and every time we add a new war or a new interaction, it decreases the money that's available for other things. And um, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. Uh, yeah, above my pay grade. Above your pay grade. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I guess you do need long-term projects to come together. Yeah. It's going to take years and years to, to develop the technology, test things out. There's no way you're going to get this within two years. Definitely, you know, yeah. and hard within eight years, yeah. And, and I can only hope that with commercial funding, uh, companies can think longer term. We are now learning just how long Steve Jobs was working on things like the iPhone and how many generations ahead he was already working on when he passed away. Um, if that same sort of long-term vision can be applied to commercial space programs, that may be the answer we need. Yeah. Um, so T. Whalen sort of made a couple of comments here, and I think this is really good. So, uh, when the ISS is deemed unusable as a station, I hope they don't waste the lofted mass. I hope they'll convert some of it into spaceships. Why waste money to deorbit this very expensive mass, you know, turn into into something else? Do you think that's feasible? Well, it, as, as I said, they are looking to repurpose some of the modules, but the reality is that for better or worse, uh, with the exception of the Dragon capsule bringing back garbage, uh, all of the prior progress modules have either dragged back things that they were removing from the space station or have carried back the garbage and burnt it all up in the atmosphere. And this is actually something that really bothers me is uh, we only have so many resources in the planet Earth. We're not ready to go start getting them from asteroids and Everything from helium gas to nubidium ma magnets, there, there's so many rare earths that are getting more and more rare that we just can't nab them when we need to. Um, let's see. Okay, so a bunch of questions here. Let me see. Uh, so the Jonathan4454 asks, are, there, are they anywhere close to inventing shields like in Star Trek to protect the ISS from space junk? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no. No, they're, I mean, they're, there are plans in the works to develop um, sort of magnetic shielding that would protect spacecraft from radiation and solar wind and things like that, but not anything that could actually redirect objects, you know, mass. Yeah. Uh, Paul Hughes asks, is there any further advancements in creating a space elevator? No. No. Not yet. No. We did a whole show on space elevators, though, didn't we? We d we did, but that doesn't mean that people have had breakthroughs. No, no, I know the episode the was. You know, these are all wonderful ideas, and none of it's happening right now. Yeah. Um, so Guido Bieber asks, maybe a silly question, but would it be possible to push the ISS into some sort of stable orbit or one of the Lagrange points to make it an unmanned observatory? Um, you could, but that would take a whole lot of fuel, so it really doesn't make sense. I mean, raising its orbit into something that wouldn't decay as quickly as it does. I mean, I know it's decaying. You know, they're constantly having to boost its orbit up. Yeah. So they could definitely put a bunch of rockets on and just keep raising it and raising it until its decay orbit would take a, a much longer time. But, but, but then we couldn't get people back to it. Co you couldn't access it as easily, right? Yeah. That's sort of why you want to keep it so low is that it's just quicker and easier to get. To. Well, they, they actually lowered its orbit a lot when they were servicing it with the space shuttle because the space shuttle isn't that heavy lift of a vehicle, especially after the Columbia accident in 2003. They they needed to, to bring it down so that they could use the space station's rockets rather than the space shuttle's rockets to get the modules uh, back up to a higher orbit once they were attached. 
Uh, Graham Stickings asks, uh, what is the best site to find out when ISS is passing your location overhead and to be able to photograph it? Heavens Above. Heavens Above? You like Heavens yeah. Above? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, my, my favorite one is I, I prefer to not to like, like go looking for it. I, I like that information to just come to me. So there's a, um, uh, on Twitter, there's a service called Twist, T-W-I-S-S-T. -S -S and so if you go to Twist and you follow it, then you will get a notification when there's going to be good space station passes over your area. And that's and the DM. Get, uh, well, no, they don't do it as a, as a DM. So they actually have a whole pile of extra twist accounts, and then they, okay. they mention you. Yeah. But anyway, you get a mention when it, when it's going to happen, and it'll say, like, there's a bright pass at this time and a dim pass at that time or whatever. And they're able to tell from your from your location in Twitter, and then they do the calculation for you and tell you when you're going to see it. So it's a wonderful service. I love it. And so I, I often I'll get, you know, I like that sort of, you know, it's just randomness. And you're like, oh, check this out. And you just walk outside, you look up, and there goes the space station. I, you know, I, you know, probably once a month or so, I get a chance to see the space station. It's just, it's so obvious. I mean, if you know when and where it's going to be, it is the brightest object in the sky. You know, it's as bright as Jupiter going overhead. So, um, uh, Billy the Fish 2001 asks, uh, have there been any serious collisions with the International Space Station? Not yet, but they have had to ask the astronauts to um, seek shelter in the attached Soyuz capsules in case something did happen to the ISS and they needed to quickly abandon ship. Yeah, so there have been, uh, and we actually just posted an article on this on Universe Today just just today about uh, you know people hoping that more space debris is going to be removed from orbit. Yeah. So I would say... Every couple of months, they have yeah. to actually move the space station to sort of dodge a piece of debris. And, you know, when they go out and actually examine the outside of the spacecraft, they see quite a lot of little tiny impacts and little, you know, just the sort of dust that it's plowing through. So I don't think there's been anything that's been, definitely nothing that's been, catast you know, catastrophic. Okay, so there's like a... Um, Chris Has Hadfield actually just tweeted about a small hole that was made. Yeah, the yeah. bullet hole like yeah. thing appearing in the solar arrays. Yeah, so there's a little tiny hole, and I'll I'll, get, I'll grab the picture here so you can see it. Um, let me see if this works. So I, I don't know if people are going to be able to see it, but there is. Uh, I don't know if you can see my my the mouse here. Right spot. Right yeah. there. So there's a little spot there, and that was a that's a micrometeorite that went right through the space station, just punched a hole right through the the solar, solar array. Right. You know, totally, totally expected. And uh, if that had gone through a person, it would not have been pleasant. No. So it's just one of the risks that they deal with. Um, Dex Luther asks, <laughs> that's an awesome name. Um, I had a question. Who decides for the ISS? Who chooses which modules are accepted and, and what's going to be attached. Now that's all been planned, right? Yeah, yeah. So so occasionally uh, in the past you ran into incidents of things that were agreed upon in international treaty suddenly became much smaller or eradicated due to funding cuts here in the United States. Um, the one module that never shrank was really the Japanese um, uh, ki ki Kibu? 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 Kibo? Yeah. Kibo uh, module. It's it's really a workhorse for science, even if I can't remember how to pronounce it. And so it's pretty much the only one that the U.S. Congress didn't manage to shrink in size of the international partners. But uh, yeah, everything was decided by treaty, and then Congress occasionally decided to back out on treaties. Right. Um... Uh, well, Will Selwood says, notes, that presumably there must be a limit to the amount of stuff that can be held inside one of these inflatable stations. As much space as people take up there must be a huge chunk of the stuff needed to keep them alive. Do you know how much these Bigelow balloons inflate? So uh, what the, percentage they do? What do you mean by... I'm not understanding the question. Well, like, well, like when you have the the sort of the compressed version, how much bigger do they get when they're out in space oh. and you inflate them up? So I'm just going to look that up. Yeah. Um, 
it was actually a, a, a fair amount yeah. for the ones that they launched currently because there's like toys and junk and bugs floating around on the inside. Um, but because they weren't planning to recycle the air on the inside, it, it doesn't need a lot mm. of machinery. So, for example, so the one that, that's sort of in the works right now is called the BA330. And um, this would allow... 2100 cubic meters of living space which is about twice the capacity uh, of the International Space Station and they've got another one in plans that would provide 3240 cubic meters so that's you know uh, triple the living space of the of the International Space Station so so I mean these are they're seriously big and you know once they actually can get them up and get them launched I'm, but these would fit within a single um, heavy lift vehicle you know, so I think that, um, oh no, that, that might have been multiple modules, but, <clears throat> but, you know, I mean, the amount of space, there's a great, I'll, I'll give you this, and there's a really great uh, picture of this, I'll just, I'm going to share this one too. Give me one second. Yeah, the, the two that have gone up so far um, are 410 cubic feet, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and I'm trying to find what their packed size was. I mean, they have a much different kind of shape, and and sort of, you can imagine what it would be like to live inside of them, right? So you can see just the the shape of these things are great. So, um, uh, Andrew Planet asks, do they have a means to patch up the ISS in an emergency if punctured yeah. by an incoming object? Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so the launched diameter of the Bigelow is 1.6 meters, and then it inflates to 14.4 meters. There you go. 4.4 meters. 14. Yeah, so from 1 to 4, so it's like a yeah. four times increase in, in size. So that's good. Yeah, yeah I think I, I really have a lot of hope for the inflatable spacecraft idea and you can imagine other situations right like you inflate your spacecraft and then you could put you could store your water for example around the outside of the space station as a layer that you're going to be drinking in you know anyway and water is a fantastic protector from radiation and even possibly micrometeorite debris so so there's some you know some really interesting technologies that are in the works that could solve a lot of these problems and the and the uh, the inflatables are definitely on the right track um, I think we're good. I think we caught most of them. Uh, oh, someone else recommended, um, Robert Scott Herrick says, get a text message when the ISS is flying over at spotthestation.nasa.gov. So uh, that's a great one as well. So you just give them your text number, give them your location, and then when the space station's about to head over, just you'll get your text, walk outside, look up, there it goes. It's a great party trick, too. I don't know if you've ever done this. I've had, you know, like, oh, hey, why don't you come over and check this out? Tell, I told my neighbor, like, oh, yeah, check this out. You know, and then, boom, there goes the space station. How did you right. know? <laughs> Technology. <laughs> so. uh, cool. Well, I think we're done. Uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we wrap this up? Uh, Zenite Org says, wouldn't you end up drinking radioactive water? Uh, no, I don't think mm -hmm. you do with this, with the using your water as a protection because you're, you're essentially going to be getting radiation in your water anyway. So it's, you know, you just yeah, it around you. You don't the, have to protect your water. So the, the problem with radiation when it hits the human body is it's extremely high energy particles that yeah. zap your DNA and cause mutations or cancer or other badness. I depending on what type of radi radioactive particle it is, water can simply stop that high-energy particle's motion. So, for instance, a, a helium atom that's moving extraordinarily fast and is stripped of its um, electrons is, is called an alpha particle. And it's just helium nuclei. It, by itself, hitting the water is going to do no harm. Yeah. Um, a gamma ray is nothing more than a particle of light that has extremely high energy. Um, that might cause the water, if it's heavy water, to fluoresce or something otherwise interesting, but uh, generally you don't drink heavy water, so not a concern. Right, it's so if you're catching atoms of, uh, of uranium mm -hmm. and plutonium and then they're gonna hang out in your water and 
yeah, continue that emitting radiation. No, that happen. doesn't happen. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we can wrap this up. Thanks to everybody who was watched us today. Um, and thank you very much, Pamela, for bringing your knowledge. Uh, you weren't all completely uh, used up. So I think you, you get your brain for the rest of this week. I do. We leave you with it. Um, but uh, but there's some more stuff happening this week, right? Um, yes. So there is Wednesday is Learning Space. I'm not sure what the, this week's topic is. That's at 6 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, midnight England. Um, then we have Thursday, the Planetary Society has their weekly podcast. Friday is the weekly space hangout. Um, Sunday will be the virtual star party. So awesome. we're full up with activities. Um, and Oh, and Wesley DeFlita asks, uh, what about the part four future space stations? So did you have any interest in us sort of yes. looking out into the future? You want to still do that? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to talk about like rotating space stations and and ring worlds and all kinds of crazy stuff. So I'd love to sort of, Sounds you know, good. I get one of my shows, one of my <laughs> crazy speculating shows. So that'll be I'm great. I'm fine with that. Awesome. All right, cool. All right, well, thank you very much, Pamela. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you all uh, next time.